It's been a long fall break. <laughs> Lots of good stuff to talk about. Um, all right. So, um, we're going to have, have homework due today. Um, so, I hope you guys are not done. Uh, and then we will have some new slides coming. So. All right. Um, so, what we're talking about right now is wave mechanics. Wave mechanics is really what we're looking at is quantum mechanics in the position or momentum representations. And the physical context we're looking at is thinking about a particle of some mass and a moving a single particle of the moment uh, moving under the influence of some uh, conservative potential. And the Hamiltonian that is uh, a familiar form for mechanics, kinetic and potential energy. And the uh, Schrodinger equation then uh, takes the form of wave equations. So the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, as we've derived it, takes the form of a time-dependent wave equation. And uh, the time-independent Schrodinger equation, which tells us about the stationary states, i.e. the energy eigenstates of the system, uh, takes the form of a uh, time-independent wave equation. Um, of this form. And if we think about, as we discussed, the case where the particle, the free particle, where there's no force, no external potential, then the Hamiltonian is just kinetic energy. The time independent Schroeder equation takes this form, which is uh, a familiar wave equation, it's the Helmholtz equation. Okay. And we can instantly write down the eigenstates of the, of the Hamiltonian, the stationary states, because we see that this Hamiltonian clearly commutes with all components of momentum. And thus, we, the momentum eigenstates, the eigenstates of the momentum operator are also eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. So that's uh, a way we can write down instantly the free particle stationary states. So they are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with this eigenvalue. Okay? Um, and the form of those, the wave function is, of course, the position representation of the momentum eigenvectors or plane waves. Right? Uh, so from this we see that if we have a free particle, the free particle, we can talk about free particle eigenstates as plane waves with definite momentum. And uh, those plane waves, of course, we remember from our study of waves, uh, have this form where this parameter is the wave vector. And thus we relate from this the De Broglie relationship, which relates the momentum to the wavelength, or the momentum to the wave vector, the momentum vector to the wave vector. And the relationship between the wavelength of the particle and the wave number is here, and that's the Broglie. And from this, we see for a free particle, we have, we derive the dispersion relation that tells us the relationship between the frequency and wavelength, or frequency and wave number. And that is really, so the wave particle duality expression tells us that the energy relationship between energy and momentum translates in the wave language into a relationship between the frequency and the wave number, or the frequency and the wave number. Okay? And 
for a free particle, we have this kind of quadratic uh, relationship, okay? which tells us that a free particle for a non-relativistic particle of mass m has a quadratic dispersion relation, which means that the, the um, waves disperse. Different wavelengths move at different phase velocities. And because of that, if you have a wave packet, which is a, has some uh, spread uh, in momentum, it will disperse. Okay. And you're finishing up your homework on that topic. If you haven't already done that. Okay. Any questions? So um, I want to continue here today to get some a deeper uh, intuition and understanding of the nature of the wave function and the relationship of wave mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, and classical mechanics. Okay. So let me. which is 
the product of psi at x prime and psi star at a different x. So this is telling me about the coherences. And if I have generally a mixed state, it could be the case that the coherence length, the distance over which the wave function exhibits coherence, need not be the same thing as the um, uncertainty in the position. Okay. I can have a situation where I have you know, a beam that has a big uncertainty where the particle is, but it may not exhibit coherence over that. Right? OK, so that's one part of the interpretation, uh, the probability density and the coherences. Uh, let's take a look, though. So let me call this probability density here, just from this point, I'll call it rho of x and z. That's the diagonal matrix of it. Okay. Okay, let's look at this. Uh, for the, it doesn't really matter where it's a pure mixed state. It's easiest to deal with this for a pure state. We would just have to average over the ensemble of possible pure states if we had a general mixed state. So I'll just focus my attention for the remainder on the pure state case. And let's consider how the probability density changes as a function of time. Okay? So that's equal to Have a mixed state, we would just average over the ensemble of states, so it doesn't change anything. And now we know how these guys evolve according to the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Okay? So this is equal to uh, minus i over h bar h psi star plus psi star minus. Minus i over h bar and a half on the one on psi, all in the position representation. Now, this will be equal to y. Well, the term that has to do with uh, the potential will cancel, right? Because the star of this gives me a plus i. And here I got a minus i, and the potential term will cancel out. So all I'm left with here then is uh, minus i over h bar plus times um, minus h bar squared over 2 and Laplacian star psi. Uh, minus i over h bar psi star h bar squared minus h bar squared over qm Laplacian psi. Okay, determine the potential, cancel that. Into the gradient of that. So that was 
vector tau identities that quickly derive with a couple of epsilon you know, k's or something like that. In this case, it's just something like that. So using that, uh, the following holds. conservation of probability. 
probability to find a particle somewhere. This is saying that the particle is neither created nor destroyed. It just moves around. And there's a flux of probability if the particle is moving. So let's say the probability density can change with time because the particle can move. Okay. Now, of course, we know in relativistic quantum mechanics, particles are created and destroyed. So we have to think, we have to think harder about that problem, what we're talking about when we have sort of the equivalent of the continuity equation of quantum field theory. Maybe we'll get to that at some point. But for the moment, in non-relativistic theory, the particle is neither created nor destroyed. Okay. And you notice that this came from the fact in the mathematics that the potential was real. If the potential had an imaginary part in it, there was a, somehow a complex potential then it wouldn't have canceled, right, in this equation. So we got from, you know, from here to here because V is real. So one way to mock up absorption of a particle is to put an imaginary part in the potential. Kind of like you put an imaginary part in the index of a fraction when you want to deal with absorption. Probability current and conservation. All right, so to further get some insight into the nature of wave mechanics, we're going to uh, make a connection to geometric optics through what's known as the iconic. It's a complex number. It has an amplitude and a phase, right? A magnitude and a phase. So I'm going to write it as a real amplitude and a phase. Now that phase, I'm going to write in units of h bar for reasons that will become apparent later. You don't have to do that, but I'm just going to write it so that it has the units of h. So this is the amplitude and the phase. They're both real functions, right? All right, that's just an ansatz. It's an assumed form. We've done no approximation. We're just going to plug it in. So let's plug this into uh, the uh, well, before I do that, we could say just a couple of things quick. Firstly, note that the probability density is just the square of the amplitude. And moreover, what we would say is that the surfaces constant S are wave fronts in wave theory. All right, now let's plug this in in time dependent. Now, it's a bit of a drag to do that, because we have to take the Laplacian of this thing, right? And then we have to use, you know, the product rule on that. And then we have all kinds of 
uh, vector identities to begin with. But I'm, so I'm not going to do all that. I'm just going to write down the answer. And that's why I'm cheating with my iPad today. I'm too lazy. I'll do that algebra on the board, right? see what's going on here, right? I mean, the right-hand side, if you take the derivative with respect to time, that's the, you know, that's the, what was the left-hand side of the equation over there? You got a derivative of the amplitude and the derivative of the phase and the derivative, and then, you know, you got the e to the i thing and I cancel that on both sides. Um, over here, I have a Laplacian, and that has all these different derivatives. You have second derivatives on the amplitude, you have second derivatives on the phase, and then all the cross terms. You take you know, a derivative of each way. So that's where it's going on. You just kind of do it all. Okay? All right, so that doesn't look helpful. However, it is. So let's, everything here, as I said, A and S are real uh, functions, which means that separately, the real part of this equation equals the real part of this equation, or this side, and the imaginary part equals the imaginary part. So we have two equations, one for the real part of this equation, and one for the imaginary part of this equation. All right. So, uh, so separating real and imaginary parts, We have the following. sides by A, and then divide by 2. And here's what I mean. Shouldn't that be over H bar? Possibly. You can put in all the H bars afterwards. I'm not going to worry about the H bars. So, All right. 
right, so now we're getting What can we say about these two things? Well, let's look at this first equation up here. Anyone have any thoughts about that equation? Yeah, it's, it's, kind of it's, got it, it's got that. But what does it look like? Looks like the continuity equation, right? In fact, it is the continuity equation. Because what is a squared? Probability. A squared is rho. It's probability density. So this is equivalent to, this is d by dt of rho is minus, right, the continuity equation. The equation that says that the particle isn't lost or created. But what is j then? What is the probability current when expressed in the icono form? Uh, uh, sorry, there's a in here. Yep, that's right. So look at it. It's equal to rho times this. The gradient of the phase divided by the mass. Now, if I have a fluid, and the fluid, let's go back to the B over here. Let's go back to our picture of the fluid. And let's say that right here at this position, the fluid is flowing with some velocity at that position. Okay. And suppose the local density right at that position is rho. I ask you, what is the local current density at that position? If I have fluid flowing, those of you who know fluid dynamics should know this stuff. Rho times B. Rho times B. So, what this tells me is the following. That the local probability is flowing with a local velocity. This is the effective local velocity. saying that the mass times the local, this is the effective local momentum at that position of the flow. So how do we uh, interpret that picture? Well, what is S? Well, S was the phase. And we said that contours or surfaces of constant S, so this is a locus of points, a surface where S of X and T is a constant. What is the gradient? So the gradient are the normals to this. So the um, local gradient of the wave fronts represent the way in which the probability is flowing. And these, in optics, are known as the rays. So if I have a, uh, 
a wavefront, and I want to know what direction the light ray is moving. The light ray is moving perpendicular to the wavefront. It's the local ray. Okay, well, moreover, if we look at, now let's look at this equation, which tells us how those wavefronts change with time. If we look at this equation, I'll call this the limit where h bar goes to zero. Let's say, let's consider that first. Let's suppose h bar was zero. Then what is this equation? That equation is this. If I which is saying the Hamiltonian evaluated at x and p is the gradient of s plus the s dt. This equation actually has a name in classical mechanics. You probably haven't studied it, and you probably never will, because you never take 503 here. But it's an important equation in classical mechanics. And it has a name that's called the hamilton jacobi equation. What is the hamilton jacobi equation? Well, the hamilton jacobi equation is another way of solving for the classical trajectories of a particle of mass n in this case, moving under the influence of this potential. If you solve this equation, and you, what it tells me is that if I find s, then p, and solve this equation, then whatever I get for s from this equation, the local momentum at that position in time is the gradient. This function is known as Hamilton's principal function. this much more precise. In this limit that h bar goes to zero, I don't have to explain what the heck we mean by that. Okay? That quantum mechanics in some way has as its limit classical dynamics. That's to say that the particle moves with a momentum that's given exactly from what you would get from classical mechanics for that Hamiltonian. It moves along a trajectory that is, can always be solved from the Hamilton-Jacobi equation as the local rays to wavefronts. That was, Hamilton knew that well before quantum mechanics on that one. Yeah, some decades. I forget when Hamilton was, but you know, it's hard to know. Quantum mechanics. I don't know. Sometimes in the 19th century. Now, what is that limit here? What we did is that what we really did is that we ignored the term here. So let's go back to that. Um, I'll come back to this. Here. So there's this term here. The term that has h bar. And uh, that's the term that we neglected. Okay. So the Hamilton Jacobi equation is uh, a good approximation, for example, when this is 
much, much bigger than this. get a feeling for what that might mean. Let's suppose I had something that was kind of like a plane wave. With some amplitude e to the i Something that looks like that. So this approximation is saying that h bar squared h squared over 2n is uh, much, much bigger than h bar squared over 2n. So in some sense, what that length scale is telling us, that amplitude is changing because it's not really free particle, it's a potential. So really, and it's an important point here, that this length scale is sort of the scale over which V changes. So it's saying something about the particle is moving in this potential. Potential is not uniform, although it's disappearing. There would be no right? And how does the particle move in this potential? Well, if the wavelength associated with that momentum is tiny compared to that scale, then the wave nature of the problem is negligible. And it looks more like trajectories of rays. We know this from our studies of basic optics. If a, if I oops, I'm sorry, if I you know put a laser pointer through this door, it doesn't diffract. The reason it doesn't diffract is the length scale associated with this slit is huge compared to the wavelength. And under that condition, I can just think about gray optics. I don't have to think about diffraction or any wave-like property. The thing that's, what we're learning here is that the geometric optics limit of quantum mechanics is classical mechanics. Okay. 
That is to say, so let me make this a little bit more apparent. Where there's a local wave vector, I would say if this were a constant, we know what the wave vector is. The wave vector is omega over c times the index of a fraction. And the index of a fraction is the square root of the dielectric constant. Right? But now what I'm saying is that there's a local index of a fraction at every position in this in homogeneous dielectric. And it says there's a ray that moves through there with a local wave vector that depends on the gradient of the index. And as long as the wavelength is much, much, much smaller than the length scale over which the dielectric changes, then I don't have to think about solving the wave equation. I just have a trajectory of a ray. So the upshot of all of this is that wave optics is to a single particle wave mechanics as ray optics is to classical. 
classical mechanics is the ray optics limit of the wave equation. Oh wait, there's still one. So, let's look at this particular, oh, I should say, that, of course, if we didn't take this limit and we just looked at you know, this equation, including this special term, which is sometimes known as, sometimes known as the quantum potential, this is exact. We just took Schrodinger's equation, we separated out the real imaginary parts. And it's tempting, and people do follow this, that to say that really what's going on is that there's a, there's a particle that is moving in a combination of the physical potential and this quantum potential. And that's known as the um, De Broglie bohm guided uh, pilot wave theory. That's to say there is a the particle is guided through and something something having to do with the wave function. The wave function itself, the amplitude of the wave function provides something that guides the particle in sort of an effective potential. It's very hard to generalize this theory to anything more than a single particle moving in a potential. So whether this really has anything to do with the reality of quantum mechanics or not, I think is highly questionable. But people work quite hard to try to think about, well, that's really what's going on. There's really both a particle and a wave. The wave just guides the particle. look at the um, Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the case that I have for a stationary state. So now uh, my wave function the time dependence I can factor out. And we'll write, so this thing is a functor position, and then there's a phase that is typically called W. So that tells me that this Hamilton's principal function separates into a spatial part and a temporal part of this form. Okay, combining these two together. This is known as Hamilton's characteristic function. All right, let's plug that in to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, which is the equation that comes from Schrodinger's equation when we've taken the limit of geometric optics. Okay? And what we get then is the following. Uh, the gradient of W squared plus V of X is equal to E. That's to say that uh, the gradient of W is the square root of 
the energy minus the potential energy times 2 to n. That is to say, this is the classical momentum at that position. Subtract the potential energy, you got the kinetic energy, this is the momentum. So that tells me, integrating this, that W x is the integral of this over some path from some initial point to some final point, P classical x prime at the end. So, that gives us a, in the, this geometric optics that makes the same approximation to the wave function. In the short wavelength limit, stationary state wave function, function of position, is some amplitude, which we still have to calculate, e to the i Just like we wrote down over here. So this is approximate in this limit. It's a solution to the wave equation in that limit. What about the amplitude? What is the amplitude of the wave function? That is to say the magnitude is what I really want to say. Well, we have the continuity equation. This is a stationary state. Right? That's what I'm looking at here. What can you tell me about the probability density as a function of time? So the rho dt is 0. But the rho dt is minus the divergence of the probability current, right? And what's the probability current? Well, the probability current is the local probability density times the gradient of the phase. That's what we said. But this is equal to whatever that classical momentum is at that position over here. And this. this for example in one spatial dimension.
Well, we have a solution to this equation. The solution is that the local probability density at that position is some constant divided by this. Does that make sense in a kind of classical limit? This is saying that in this limit, the probability density to find the particle moving at this position is 1 over its velocity. Sure. If it's moving very slowly, it's very likely to be at that position. If it's moving very fast, then at any time you're going, very unlikely to find it there. So this is just what you would expect from just classical particle moving. And so putting that all together, we get an approximate form of the wave function. It says that the wave function, the class, the uh, stationary state wave function, <coughs> is approximately to some normalization constant, the square root of n over, well, this is the square root of that constant, whatever. It's called some normalization constant, classical at that x, e to the i. And this, um, form this approximate solution for the wave function in this limit of short wavelengths compared to the, to the particle is known as the WKB approximation. And I forget who these, who, I know this is Rewan, this is probably Cromer's, but I forget who W is. The WKB approximation it's an extremely simple way to solve for the energy eigenstates. You've done it. You just know what the classical momentum is, and that's the geometric optics limit. Now, I want to get just one piece deeper into here. And I want to talk more deeply about particles versus waves. Trajectories. make this connection deeper between in what sense is the classical dynamics like the quantum dynamics in what sense it was different. Okay. To do that I want to first quickly review in two minutes classical mechanics. Okay. So let me do that in a Action, I'm calling it S, for example. 
depends on the particular trajectory. And given that trajectory, what I do is I integrate the Lagrangian, which I, am, I substitute in that trajectory, and it's time derivative for that particular trajectory, integrated over time from the initial time. Okay.
can take you from here to here. And I weight them by this probability amplitude. The one which that was the classical solution is the one where slight perturbations around that don't change anything. So what it's saying is that when I'm in the geometric optics limit, the path that has the dominant contribution is the classical path. But when I'm not in the geometric optics limit, I have all possible paths. And that leads us to the notion of the path integral, which unfortunately we don't have time to discuss. Maybe we'll have a whole problem. I was going to try to do it, but we're out of time. And everyone wants to know about the path integral, because it's cool. But I'll just state what the result is. What's the result? So, if I want to treat this problem quantum mechanically, what am I doing? I'm saying, I'm looking at the problem where, suppose at t0, I'm at, I'm at, a, at a position. It's not a, it's, I can never really do that, but I can analyze it mathematically. So I'm at a position I can state. And I want to know the probability amplitude such so that the state at a later time is that. How do I calculate that? What's the mathematical expression? I told you at that time t0, this is the wave function. And I want to know what is the With how would I calculate that? Exactly. Thank you. So initially, this is my state. I evolve for a time that takes me from T0 to T1. And then I look at this. This is known as the propagator. It is the position matrix element of the kind of evolution operator. It's sometimes called K, or kernel, or corporal, or somebody. Corporal C. Okay. And so this, you can plug it in. I'll have notes on this if you have homework for sure. show is that this is equal to the following. This was part of Feynman's PhD thesis. A great version of Feynman. What is, what is this for? This is every possible path that can connect me from those two points. I weight that with a phase factor that depends on the classical action. This is an integral over all paths. each other out. Because they don't have the same phase? Or? They have widely different phases. So I have waves that look like this, and then waves that look like that. And, then, and they all destructively interfere, because if I slightly change the path, and if S changes slightly, 
but h bar is tiny, then that phase changes by a lot. And because the phase changes by a lot, it goes from this phase to all of a sudden that phase. And so on average, it washes out. It's only the ones that are near uh, the case where the phase doesn't change a lot for a small change in the trajectory. That is to say, the case of the stationary solutions, which will contribute uh, the most to the centrifugal when this is big compared to H bar. But this is not just about the classical limit. This is about, in general, this is a way of writing the time of evolution that connects the classical picture with the quantum picture. The connection is classically, there is, the trajectory is the one that gives us stationary action. And that's this path. But quantumly, all possible paths contribute to going from here to here. And they are way they interfere with one another. When I have the geometric optics limit, there is a dominant ray. But in general, all contribute. Yes? So, so um, I guess quantum, quantum mechanically, if like the paths themselves, they don't have to be close to the, I guess, the classical path right. that have higher amplitudes or higher uh, probability. Not necessarily. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, for example, suppose I have a potential well and I send in a particle. Classically, you know, what's going to happen? Well, here, it, come, it has some energy. Now it has, it's going to speed up and then it's going to slow down. Quantum mechanically, it can reflect. Classically, that will never happen. That's a very, that's a path very far. Now, of course, that's only going to be true if the wavelength of the particle is on the order of this well. If the wavelength is tiny compared to the size of this well, well, then it'll just be like geometric optics. There'll be no reflection. I want to make one last comment that I just, because although we describe this in terms of pure states, and we talked about the classical limit coming from being at short wavelengths, it's not exactly the full story. What's important is the coherence. The question of whether there is interference I can have a situation where the wavelength is small, but somehow I've allowed the coherence length to get big, and still see wave effects of something somewhat macroscopic. For example, there have been recent experiments that have seen diffraction of a virus. If you can keep the, if you can cool down the position of the virus enough to keep its coherence big enough, even though it's a somewhat macroscopic thing, it can diffract and end up on the screen with the probability that depends on its wave mechanics. So it's not just that it's macroscopic, it's, it's about its coherence. Let us uh, quit for today, uh, and uh, we'll talk about our.